The date is Sunday, April the 14th, 1912. While the world sleeps peacefully, out on the North Atlantic, the course of history is about to be changed forever. Titanic, the largest ship in the world. A floating palace, she is on her maiden voyage from Southampton, England to New York with just over 2,200 passengers and crew aboard her, and she is about to have a rendezvous with destiny. A destiny in the form of a massive mountain of ice. I'm Matthew Smathers. Welcome to Titanic Wreck Tours. Welcome to Episode 1 of Titanic Wreck Tours. I should be your host, as we take a look around the wreck of Titanic and explore the secrets that the sunken giant has to offer. As we explore the wreck of Titanic, you will be hearing the testimonies of some of her survivors, as well as the histories of some of those who perished. There wasn't any panic until the lifeboats left, and then there was panic galore. We were down on the ocean. We could hear them running about on the decks and screaming. You can imagine people came up from their cabin, went onto the deck, no lifeboat, tearing around the other side. That's when the panic was there. The sea was perfectly smooth when we left the ship. Every star in the heavens was visible, but there was no moon. Well, we pulled, we got away clear of the ship, and we just laid on the oars and, until eventually they... The uh, realized that she that she'd gone, and we heard all the screams. We couldn't do anything. They say there are places on this earth where the voices of history can still be heard and felt. Today, modern vessels such as cargo ships and cruise liners crisscross these waters uncaringly of the history that came before them. However, this is no ordinary spot. For beneath these waters lies the most famous ship in history. The Royal Mail Steamship, Titanic. In April of 1912, the RMS Titanic is the largest moving object ever made by man. She is not only large, but she is also luxurious. Certainly one of the most beautiful liners ever created, she is on her maiden voyage across the North Atlantic. A voyage that she and nearly 1,500 men, women, and children will never complete. Today, the Titanic sleeps peacefully at the bottom of the North Atlantic, two and a half miles below the ocean surface. And at such a depth, very few 
have actually been able to reach the site and explore her remains. But of those precious few explorers who are willing to challenge the dangers of the deep, the voices of history are never far from this site. These echoes from the deep resonate with every explorer to the Titanic. And now, it's our turn to explore the Titanic and to hear those stories told from the testimonies of her survivors. Our tour of the Titanic wreck begins at the bow, and as we pass over the now iconic forward railing, we make a close pass over the ship's anchor crane. This large crane once serviced the spare anchor directly below, and was also used to assist in mooring operations when Titanic was in port. Located directly beside either side of the anchor crane are the large fair leads, or rollers, which were intended to secure Titanic's mooring lines when she was tied to the dock. Titanic's massive anchor chains. Each length of chain is still firmly attached to an anchor, and each single link of chain weighs 175 pounds. These two hand wheels you see are called windlasses, and each windlass attached to an anchor chain was powered by a steam motor which was used to raise the anchor. The brake wheels directly below are actually for the windlasses, and directly behind is the number one cargo hatch. Like many ships of the day, the Titanic carried a modest cargo, which included everything from typewriters, rubber, textiles, even a brand new Renault Coupe de Ville, which belonged to Mr. William Carter and was crated in the cargo hold. Experts tend to tell us that the car was actually red, and it's likely still in the wreck, even to this day, although buried in debris. As we travel aft along the wreck of Titanic, we come to the third class open well deck. Here we can see the ship's mast, which has now fallen across the well deck, as well as the remnants of the crow's nest. Directly below us, we can see the twin cargo hatches, which once serviced the first class baggage compartment, as well as the mail hold, and the luggage compartment. The area we are passing over is identical to this 1912 video shot aboard Titanic's near-identical sister, the Olympic. Watching the video, it is almost impossible not to imagine how it once was. Continuing our tour aft across the cargo cranes, we come to the forward first-class promenade on A deck. It was from here, on the forward-facing promenade, that passengers could enjoy a leisurely view across the bow and take in the fresh sea air, as seen here in this photograph taken by Father Francis Brown as Titanic approached Queenstown, Ireland. The windows still plainly visible on the wreck today. Directly above this spot, the nerve center of the ship, Titanic's Bridge. It was from here that all operations were conducted for the handling of the ship. However, much of the bridge was destroyed during the sinking and the descent to the bottom. Despite this, though the bridge was destroyed, the telemotor, which once mounted Titanic's wheel, still stubbornly remains as both a stark reminder of the tragedy 
and an eerie monument to Quartermaster Hitchens, who, on April 14, 1912, vainly attempted to avoid the fatal collision with the iceberg. Moving along to the starboard side of the ship, our cameras close in on a set of collapsed windows. This was once the A-deck promenade. The windows and doorway sit on the B-deck level and actually once opened into one of the two millionaire suites aboard Titanic. Up above is a flat surface, that is the boat deck. It was upon this aptly named boat deck that Titanic's lifeboats once sat. Lifeboats that contain space for only 1,200 people. Traveling across the decaying boat deck, we come to a collapsing bulkhead that once served as the boat deck entrance to the Grand Staircase. To a wreck explorer, the Grand Staircase represents the ultimate opportunity to explore the inside of Titanic. To a passenger in 1912, the Grand Staircase, which stretched all the way from the boat deck all the way down to F deck, represented the single best and most opulent place on the ship to be seen. It was a place where one could make a grand entrance, and now it will serve as our entrance into history. She was the last word in luxury. All her public rooms were absolutely amazing. All the woodwork was beautifully carved, and she had everything, everything that you could think of. That, that she was a beautiful ship. They uh, had many card parties and, and get people acquainted. We had de deck courts and, and they did all they could to make her happy. <laughs> As our cameras drop down into the interior of the grand staircase, there is little to be seen. The great carved clock that once adorned the staircase, now little more than a memory. They were enjoying life. They should do. They had everything. Finest food they ever could be prepared for them. And all the luxury of having wonderful public rooms to go to, orchestra, dancers, lifeboats were things thing that they weren't necessary. You see, we were, we were on a ship that was unsinkable. As we travel further down the ruined corridors of the Titanic and away from the staircase, we come across a chandelier still stubbornly hanging from the remnants of the ceiling. The woodwork looking remarkably intact, considering it's been on the bottom of the ocean for more than a century. Our cameras travel down the corridors to peer into the first-class passenger cabins. Most of the walls have long since crumbled, and strange stalactite forms of life, known as rusticles, dangle from every surface. The rusticles are actually a form of bacteria that is eating Titanic. We had a very wonderful cabin. It had uh, two bunks and a couch in it. And I had, the couch was turned into a bed at night and I had the couch for my bed. As our cameras travel further inside the ruined first-class cabins of the Titanic, we come across a brass bed in the remnants of cabin A-25. Cabin A-25 was, of course, unoccupied. The Titanic was designed to carry 3,300 passengers and crew, though on her ill-fated first and last voyage, she was, contrary to popular belief, only carrying about 2,200. The large marble sink, though buried in debris, is still visible, as well as the brass and bronze accented headboard for the bed, looking remarkably intact considering its age. Our camera pans around the room to reveal the ruins of this once beautiful cabin, much of which has sadly collapsed. The interiors of Titanic are very disorientating to explore, and we will have to give them a more in-depth look at a later time. 
For all her luxury, her glitz and glamour, the Titanic was not without purpose. She was primarily built as an immigrant ship to ply the North Atlantic passenger trade to take emigrants from Europe to the New World. Her maiden voyage saw her travel Southampton, England, to New York by way of Cherbourg and Queenstown, a voyage which was expected to last just seven days. And, with minor exception to the events of her departure, most of her survivors would recall the events leading up to the 14th as both unmemorable and uneventful. We were steaming that night at a good 22 knots. At 10 o'clock, I was relieved as officer of the watch by Murdoch, W.M. Murdoch. He and I had been shipmates in many of the ocean greyhounds. After the usual formalities, I handed over, wished him joy of a few perishing cold hours, went below. I expect his watch went on as mine had done. Nothing to see, nothing to hear, except the distant roar of the water at her bows, that and the half-hourly bells with a lookout must cry of all's well. Of course, he knew nothing of the death trap lying ahead of us any more than I did. As we travel up the now fallen mast, the stage is set for disaster. That twisted piece of steel you see coming into view is all that remains of the crow's nest where lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee were peering into the night. The wire you see coming out of the doorframe was once attached to the telephone, and above the doorframe there is a bracket just coming into view, which once held Titanic's bell. But barely ten minutes had passed after the sound of the last bell, when there were three sharp clangs on the crow's nest bell, followed by a cry from the lookout cage, Ice right ahead, sir! Murdoch Evangly saw the mass of ice practically at the same time as the lookout men, and shouted, Hard of starboard, full speed astern! His idea was to swing her bow clear, and then put the helm hard over the other way, and so swing her stern clear. And given half a chance, I believe he'd have done it. But going at that speed, it was too late. As it was, her bow swung a bit, but not enough, and she struck. She took the blow of her starboard side, masses of ice actually falling on the fore deck. And as I got out on the promenade deck, I saw a large grey, well, it looked to me like a building, floating by. Great big grey thing. But that building kept bumping along the rail, and as it bumped, it sliced off bits of ice, and ice fell all over the, the deck. I looked along the side. And I saw what I thought was a wind jammer, but as it came astern, I saw it was an iceberg. I was talking to a pal of mine, he was sitting on my bunk. All of a sudden, she came to a halt. There was no fuss. It was like putting your brakes on a car, and you gradually came to a halt. And I went for it on the uh, promenade deck, and I looked down. I couldn't see any any damage at all above the waterline. What I did see was ice in the well deck, the forward well deck. And I thought, hello, we've hit an iceberg. And I, and a great many of my foolish fellow, fellow passengers, we just picked up the ice and started to play snowballs. We thought it was fun. We asked the officers if there was any danger and said, no, nothing at all, nothing at all, nothing at all, just a mere, mere nothing. We just hit an iceberg. It's nothing, nothing. And I got to the bridge, and the captain had evidently arrived about the same moment, and I heard him say to Murdoch, what's, what's the matter, what if you're stuck? He said, we're stuck an iceberg, so. Desiring an accurate assessment of the situation, Captain Smith orders Titanic's chief designer, Thomas Andrews, 
to go below and report on the damage. Andrew's report is grim. The iceberg has popped rivets, opened seams, and torn a gash in the first six compartments of Titanic's hull. The watertight doors, which were closed immediately after the collision, will hold back the water, but only temporarily. No matter what they do, from this moment forward, the Titanic is doomed. Moving across the Titanic's officers' quarters, we approach the Marconi room skylight. Andrews has given the ship an hour and a half, possibly two, and Captain Smith, understanding the situation, immediately orders a distress call. And I got back to the boat deck and saw the captain, and I told him, I said, the mail room's filling, sir. Should I send a distress signal? And the captain said, I've already sent a distress signal, and Phillips, the wireless operator, is bending over his instrument, the telephone, holding the telephone. He says, I'm, I'm in contact with the Carpathia. Titanic's wireless operators, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, desperately try to call for help. The Carpathia, the Cunard liner, is eastbound from New York to the Mediterranean. However, though she is the closest ship to respond, she will not arrive for four hours. By then, the captain had ordered out lifeboats and women and children. Lower the lifeboats and stand by. That was the order. Stand by. As Titanic's lifeboats are uncovered and swung out, Captain Smith decides not to create a panic. As a consequence, most of Titanic's officers are not made aware that the ship is actually sinking. Consequently, many passengers question the sanity of leaving the ship in the middle of the night. At the time of getting away the first few boats, no one believed that the ship was actually in any danger. I'm afraid my own confidence that she wouldn't or couldn't sink rather conveyed itself to others. For there were actually cases where women absolutely refused to be put in a boat. Now we were told we were only going to leave because it was rules and regulations. No danger whatsoever. We'd all be back for breakfast. And I thought it was perfectly asinine to leave a warm, comfortable ship to come back for breakfast. Oh, that was why. The English have got rules and regulations, but they're just plumb crazy. I'm sticking to this ship. The drop from the boat deck to the water was about between 70 and 80 feet. And you could hardly see the water, and people didn't want to go. They, they got in their minds she was unsinkable. But the Titanic is not unsinkable. As the great liner slowly settles at the bow, the passengers begin to evacuate the ship. However, initially, many elect to remain aboard. Though debatable as to just how many of the crew understood the seriousness of the situation, few of the passengers actually can comprehend Titanic could possibly be in any danger. On the starboard side boat deck, lifeboat number seven is one of the first, if not the first, to be launched. With a capacity for 65, she leaves the ship with only 28 people, including actress Dorothy Gibson and lookout Archie Jewell. Gibson would star in Saved from the Titanic, the first ever motion picture made to be done about the disaster, while Archie Jewell would survive the sinking of the HMHS Britannic, Titanic's ill-fated sister in the First World War. Moving in for a closer look on Titanic's promenade deck, on A deck, we get a good look at the windows that once graced this elegant part of the ship with natural sunlight and illuminated the interior cabins. 
The call for women and children first seemed to have been different in the various classes on Titanic, the first class being notified individually by their stewards, valets, and maids, the second class receiving a knock on the door, while the third class were rudely roused from their sleep by stewards who were throwing doors open and shouting amidst confusion, as many of the third-class passengers did not speak English. Second-class passenger Ava Hart recalls quite vividly how her father left them to assess the situation and then returned to see them to the boat deck. My father came back very quickly because he could get up to the boat deck in the lift very quickly from where our cabin was. And, um, he came back and he picked me up and wrapped his blanket tightly around me as if I were a baby. And without any words at all, and we went out of the cabin and into the lift and up onto the boat deck. My father went away and spoke to an officer and he said, um, they are going to launch lifeboats, but you will be back on board for breakfast. The prevailing thought aboard Titanic during the evacuation was that the women and children would be put off in the lifeboats as a precaution while the crew tended to the emergency. Nerves were beginning to run high as families were being torn apart forever. In the midst of this, Wallace Hartley and the Titanic's orchestra stepped out onto the port boat deck adjacent the grand staircase and began to play ragtime tunes to calm the nerves of the passengers. Nearby, a twisted lifeboat davit once held lifeboat number eight. And here, as crew gestured for passengers to get in and evacuate, stepped Isidore and Ida Strauss. Mr. Strauss, a co-founder of Macy's department store, was initially denied entry into a boat, and his wife, Ida, who had been in the boat, promptly stepped out to rejoin her husband. Despite being implored to take her place in a boat, she meekly told her husband, We have been together for many years, Isidore. Where you go, I go. They both stepped aside and would perish together. Moving along the port side boat deck, we soon come to the remnants of lifeboat station number six. The davits themselves are gone, leaving only the chocks that once cradled the lifeboats and the turnbuckle that once secured them. Here, as passengers were being loaded, in some cases forcibly, Denver mining millionaires Margaret Brown stood watching and though she was assisting in the loading of the boat, an officer rudely picked her up and placed her into the boat. Unruffled by the experience, she would later all but commandeer the boat, encourage the women to row to keep warm, reprimand Quartermaster Hitchens at the tiller, and would be forever remembered as the unsinkable Molly Brown. As time went on, I could see the bows of the ship getting steadily lower and lower in the water. Now, between lowering one boat and another, I frequently took a run forward and a quick look down a long stairway that led from the boat deck three or four decks down. Frankly, I'm never likely to forget the sight of that cold greenish water creeping step by step up that stairway. Some of the lights were shining down on the water, and others, already submerged, were giving it a sort of ghastly transparency. Just when I first realized how desperately serious things were, I don't know. But I do know that before many boats were away, I got to piling more and more people into them. Partly because I now knew she was going, and partly because the boats were not remaining by the ship to be filled to their full capacity when waterborne. The reason that the lifeboats would not return to pick up more survivors till after Titanic had already gone down 
was a justifiable fear of suction. Most of Titanic's survivors believed that the great liner would create a vortex in the ocean as she went down, and could potentially pull all the boats down with them. Consequently, many chose to stay away from the ship. The captain came across the bridge and said, Mr. Boxall, you go away in that boat, pointing to the port emergency boat number two. And uh, he said, hurry up, Mr. Wild waiting to lower it. So I tumbled into this lifeboat and we got lowered down. I found that I, I only had three of the ship's crew, a spud, a cook, and a sailor. She had been lowered very slowly. She wouldn't run until you helped the falls and eventually became waterborne. I tried to count the passengers, but it was difficult as they didn't speak English, you see. And I reckon that I had between 30, about, around about 30 on board the boat. I had great difficulty in getting the boat around there. There was suction. I was using a stroke or standing up and there was a lady helping. She was steering the boat round the ship's stern. When I passed round the boat, to try and get to this gangway door on the starboard side, her propellers were out of water. I'm not certain if I didn't pass underneath them. As our cameras close in on the ruined stern section of Titanic, we get a close-up look at the starboard, or outer wing, propeller. The Titanic, of course, had three of them, and the outer propellers were the largest of all. Each massive propeller had a diameter of 23 and a half feet, or 7.2 meters. As the great liner went down at the bow, her massive stern rose into the night sky, lifting the propellers clear. Oh, One cannot help but wonder if this propeller was last glimpsed by Boxall as he rode beneath the stern. As the forward angle of Titanic's list increased, it became apparent to many on board that something was terribly wrong. Still, thinking it not too serious, Colonel John Jacob Astor took his pregnant bride Madeline to lifeboat number four on the A-deck promenade. Astor loaded his wife into the boat through these windows and then asked 2nd Officer Charles Lightoller if he could accompany her, since she was in delicate condition. Officer Lightoller refused, stating it was women and children only. The colonel then politely bowed aside, kissed his wife farewell, and then asked Lightoller what number of boats she was being loaded in so she could be located later. He then stepped aside and watched the lifeboat being lowered. It would be the last time Madeline Astor ever saw him. It was around this time, about 140, that lifeboat number 14 was being launched. In it was Ava Hart and her mother. Her father, having put them into the boat, helped to lower it and then stepped aside to watch it lower out of sight. And so, they launched these boats, and to my father helped. He knew a lot about the sea. And he put me in the lifeboat and told me to be good. He said to me, hold Mummy's hand, and I thought he was coming after me, but he didn't. Then it dawned on me, of course, that he wasn't coming, that I wouldn't see him anymore. It was so sad to have to take the, the wives away from their husbands and leave the husbands up on deck. And I knew that she was sinking then. And I knew what chances we were just waiting for death. Everywhere on Titanic, families were being torn apart forever. And yet, as the great liner settled at the bow, at the forwardmost boat station on the starboard side, lifeboat number one, being launched by First Officer William Murdoch, a mystery was being born. Lifeboat number one left the Titanic with only 12 seats occupied. Even to this day, it is unclear how this was possible at such a late stage of the sinking that a lifeboat left Titanic almost completely empty. 
What is known is that the boat's prolific passengers, Sir Cosmo and Lady Lucille Duff Gordon, would be the subject of controversy for years to come. Well, I made up my mind I wasn't going to leave the ship. Bruce Ismay stood on B deck and kept calling out, All women and children, come to B deck. I went up twice. It was so cold. I thought myself was idiotic. I'm going back. And I went back twice to A deck and sat down until finally Bruce Ismay spied me and called out to me. He said, All women and children, I thought had left the ship. Come up here. And I looked down and found I'd lost one of my buckles on my shoe. Uh, I wanted that buckle. I was that much interested in the buckle and absolutely disinterested in anything pertaining to saving my life because, after all, it was an unsinkable ship, you see. What could happen to me? Moreover, I had my little pig. Nothing could happen to me. So I walked along the rail and I found a gentleman standing at the rail. Strangely enough, the very gentleman that I had told on the tender that I was frightened to take the Titanic. And he said to me, hello. Come on. You're going to get off of this ship. And I said, not me. How do you expect me to get off of anything with this thing I've got on? I'm a prisoner in my own skirt. I can't even walk. Much less get up to that rail and then jump across the ocean into a lifeboat. Oh, no, not me. I'm not an acrobat. What well, he says, you'll have to. And as I stood there arguing with him, and I had my little pig, mind you, under my arm, it was white, you know, under my arm, a sailor came along. He said, yeah, now you can do as you want. But I'm going to save your baby. And he grabbed the pig, threw it into the lifeboat. So I turned around to Mr. Monk and I said, that settles it. Here I go. I don't know how I'm going to go, but I've got to go. I'm going to follow that pig. I promised my mother. Well, he may have thought I was insane. Nobody knew what the pig meant to me. So he made a cradle of his hands with another gentleman. I sat on his hands, put my arms around his neck, and he threw me, head foremost, through space. And I fell on the bottom of this, the boat and kept looking and looking for my pig. I found him with his broken, poor little legs broken, and his nose gone. Well, made me feel very badly, but I kind of turned him. I found he was still playing music. Well, that was all right. While Edith Russell was making her way down to the water, the Titanic was settling lower and lower. And it was at this point, as her decks were awash and the vessel was rapidly going down, that a mass of third-class passengers managed to make their way to the boat deck, only to discover the lifeboats were gone and chaos ensued. Just one mad rush to get into them, into the lifeboat. There wasn't any panic until the lifeboats left, and then there was panic galore. We were down on the ocean, we could hear them running about on the decks and screaming. You can imagine people came up from their cabin, went onto the deck, no lifeboat, tearing around the other side. That's when the panic was there. There wasn't any panic at the time I got the lifeboat because there weren't enough people up there. And if there were enough people there to just get into the lifeboat. But after that, when the others started coming up from their cabins and there were no boats, gosh, there was panic, we could hear it. And they were trying to jump into them as they went down. And all the boats had gone then. Then came the very last boat of all. And it was a sort of raft with collapsible canvas sides stowed upside down on top of the officer's quarters. And that's above the boat deck. A seaman named Hemming, he'd been with me in many of the mail boats, 
He and I cut this one adrift and threw it down on the water, which was now about two feet above the boat deck. Having dumped this collapsible, there was not a thing further we could do on that side. So both of us went over to the starboard side. But we found all the boats were away from there too. Of course, there were still hundreds of people round. Meanwhile, at the Grand Staircase, Wallace Hartley and the Titanic's orchestra switched to a more somber tune. With water rapidly rushing up the deck, some of the survivors in the lifeboats would claim the tune played as Song Da Tong. However, most Titanic survivors attribute the final song played as Nearer My God to Thee, a song that they played until the water washed them off the deck. We rode out, I don't know how far it was, uh, but it was beautiful, just a beautiful sight. It was, uh, all the lights were on in the Titanic and uh, it was listing just a little bit in front, you know, going down, but it was a beautiful sight. For a long time, we didn't move the boat when we laid off on the starboard side. You could see by the, uh, by the arrangements of the lights, all the lights were burning and you could see that she was going down. You could see that her stern was, was uh, getting pretty low in the water. She was certainly going down, there was no doubt about it then. The decks were lined with people, not getting off. They were lined with people looking over the railing. As Hemming and I looked down from the top of the officer's quarter where we were standing, the ship took a sudden dip, and the sea came rolling up, carrying everyone with it. Many were drowned there and then. Everyone that could just instinctively started to scramble up towards the after end of the ship. But that was only putting it off. In fact, it was lessening their chances. The plunge had to come, and that I could see was pretty soon. And no one's chances were going to be improved by getting mixed up in a struggling mass. For my part, I turned forward and took a header from the top of the wheel. I started to swim away, but got sucked down two or three times. In fact, I got mighty near the edge of things before I finally came up alongside the collapse. We'd hove into the water from the top of the officer's quarter, and there I hung on. A bit later, the foreign funnel guys carried away, and the funnel, weighing perhaps 50 or 60 tons, fell down with a crash on the water. It missed the rock by some of us hanging on to it, by inches. There were a good many of didn't. Next thing I remember, I was still hanging on to a bit of rope attached to the raft, but some 30 or 40 yards away from the ship. The wash of the falling funnel had evidently picked us up, raft and all, and flung us clear of the ship altogether. Several of us scrambled up off the slippery bottom of the raft, and it was from there I saw the Titanic sink. dead were floating, and bodies dead and alive were all round there, so there were hundreds of them round the stern of that ship, they'd all seemed to drift down that way. They were, had two boards on the stern, which said keep clear of the blades, and I was on the port one, hanging on, and eventually I slid off. As I watched I could see her bow getting deeper and deeper in the water, with the foremost sticking up above the surface, whilst her stern lifted higher and higher, till it was right out of the water. So when the boat, then when the water rushed into the boilers, there was a terrible explosion. And 
that's when I thought the book broke in half. a life jacket on and I hit the water with a trip crash but I didn't hit anything in the water I was lucky very lucky and I didn't close my eyes at all I saw that ship sink and I saw that ship breaking half and the forepart went down nose first and the other the style of that ship stood up in the water for quite a long time or oh, it seemed a long time to me then over. And we heard the dreadful sound of people drowning. When the boiler broke away, she was of course plunged into absolute darkness. Though her huge black outline was still perfectly distinct up against the stars and sky. Slowly she reared up on end, till at last she was absolutely perpendicular. Then, quite quietly, Quicker and quicker, she seemed just to slide away onto the surface and disappear. I sat on the gunwheel, and the children were crying and whimpering. It suddenly struck me, I believe I'll play music, and then the little children maybe will be diverted and amused. And there I sat, and all night long, I played them at Cheech, and the poor little children were so interested in the music box that most of them stopped crying. As she vanished, everyone around me on the upturned boat, as though they could hardly believe it, just said, she's gone. We pulled, we got away clear of the ship, and we just laid on the oars and, until eventually the, the uh, realized that, she, that she'd gone and we heard all the screams. We couldn't do anything. And um, the screams went on for some considerable time. Easy. It's what killed everybody. They didn't last long. You see, a lot of them went over with a heart that glows on. 
They didn't last long. Anyway, when I, I found Rick's and uh, he'd hurt himself, he'd hurt his legs, he dropped on something and he didn't say very much. He was a great big fellow too, very good swimmer. And uh, he died and I, I was eventually, I seemed to be all by myself. The cries, help and prayers had all subsided and everything was quiet. The screams, absolutely ghastly. But do you remember the silence that followed it? And that's quite right, it says the whole world stood still that night. Once the lights had gone, the ship had gone, the sound had gone. That was dreadful.